Hello, and welcome to Replay Value. The second episode's primary function is to introduce the rest of the relevant cast, and I think it does so in a pretty clever way given that the overarching plot thread still hasn't been established to this point. That's not to say that we don't have a plot thread to follow. The second episode is actually structured around introducing the new cast and continuing to develop the seemingly inaccurate memories that Okabe is walking around with. But outside of Kurosu, who pretty clearly fits into Okabe's misaligned state, the remaining four characters don't have a clear role to play in this current plot thread. Because we're lacking that context, Steinsgate instead keeps the introductions pretty short. We learn about their most basic traits and how they relate to the characters we already know so that we can build them into our mental character webs without spending an undue amount of time with characters whose relevance is uncertain to this point. That's a healthy amount of theory before we launch into the episode itself, and this is going to be a shorter video because of the serial introduction format it takes on. We'll be diving in deeper with all of these characters later after all. So let's explore how this structure influences the way we engage with the episode. Kurosu rightfully gets two scenes, especially since the first one is mainly just the follow-through on the cliffhanger from the previous episode. Picking up a few seconds before the first episode left off gets the audience immediately back in the mindset they had when last watching the show. And most of the dialogue is constructed to bring the audience back up to speed on the specifics in case a week away made them forget. The whole sequence though has a way of making Okabe seem completely unhinged. The way he streaks across the screen and then this panning shot to his desperation are both extremely unsettling. Kurosu's lack of control in the opening is nicely contrasted in the lecture, which is also a fun contrast to the first episodes. Both similar in the topic and the outburst, but whereas Okabe was certainly the victor in the former, he is demolished in the latter. This makes clear that Kurosu is wicked smart, and I particularly love how in the Japanese she uses the name Hoin as a spear to poke at him, as opposed to how it serves as a shield for Okabe in the first episode. There's no reference to a TARDIS, sure, but that clever bit of verbal sparring is fantastic, and the sharp shadow contrast with yellow compared to the sterile blues are a nice visual change as well. The structure of having the debate in flashback form is a particular treat because it really highlights how much Okabe got bodied as though he's thinking back to all the most embarrassing moments. We then meet Ruka. Luka. Rukako. I struggle with that sound in particular, so forgive me if I harden the R in the future. It's a quick introduction letting us meet another friend of the labs and getting Mayuri back in the story. A pretty famous and easily quotable line and then moving right along. The moment I like quite a bit in this section is as Okabe is taking Mayuri's bag, the slow movement of their hands and the deliberate flash of a landscape just as they separate. In case you missed it in the first minute of the first episode, this one is much more likely to stick with you. And it's totally out of place in a world of golden sky and water, which means that the audience will likely have no more engagement with it than a brief acknowledgement before jumping right back into the divergent memories between Okabe and everyone else. Setting up that landscape as the embodiment of separation I think is pretty cool given that we've only seen it twice to this point and the first time didn't really have any thematic meaning. After that we get the first introduction to Suzuha, who comes off as a bit of an oddball in the brief interaction, not recognizing Korn being pretty bizarre, but similarly to Ruka it's about learning the bare minimum and getting the associations in place for later. But the section with John Teeter afterwards has to be the highlight of the episode. The speed of the messages, the reflection of people reading these messages, the visualization of world lines, especially as they blend together into the white. It's just a very impressive sequence in terms of how it tells the Teeter story visually. The blending into white, for example, suggesting that that's the entirety of space and time. There's another important change between Japanese and English in this scene. The line before Teeter gets into the grandfather paradox in the Japanese is an unrelated line about CERN equaling dictators, this message, which gives a fragmented feeling to the conversation, like things are happening out of sequence. In the English, it's the actual line that's being responded to about meeting your past self, this message. That makes the dialogue make sense from a pure audio level, but it loses the feeling of things happening out of order, an inversion of cause and effect which is fantastic for being told about time travel. The constant panning over the hourglass, a symbolic representation of time as we go through this and also discover another distinct point of misalignment, Okabe's memories of owning books about Teeter are countered by Daru's complete lack of knowledge about him. 
And the lighting here is super cool in that it visually affirms that Okabe's not going to find any of the books. He's pulling from shadows, basically. This divergence, as Okabe gets a response from Teeter that confirms that his memory is seemingly wrong, is represented by the oppressive sun, which we talked about as the embodiment of natural law, in this case time, in the opening minute video. We then meet Moeka. Again, a pretty quick, she wants to find an old computer and is protective of her phone, with a kind of sad, slightly desperate disposition in how she talks. This definitely suggests more than meets the eye, not entirely dislike Suzuha, but it's nothing we're diving into to now. Again, a lot of these introductions are about setting up future developments and just getting these characters in front of our faces, which is the case with the next character on the list. Hobo in Coma then makes his way to find Daru, but not before we see what Mayuri does for work and meet Ferris, who is as delusional as he is. What cracks me up though is that Okabe assures Daru that he's not interested in her because of how she spews not but falsehoods, which is some serious pot calling kettle black absurdity. After learning about the IBM 5100 and a quick bit of foreshadowing via omelette empowered by the shadowy train ride, we arrive at the end of the episode. Similar to how the experiment was handled last time, underplaying the gel nanas, the distraction of talking about the temporary name of the phone wave and the number of bananas really pulls the rug out from under you when the banana disappears. I personally love how Okabe thinks he's getting punked and just goes full conspiracy with it before realizing that neither of them knows where it went. The appearance of the gel nana back on the bunch and the shocked reactions in time with what sounds like a heartbeat, followed by the focus blurring, really makes this moment stand out in a pretty low intensity episode. But what really gets me is how we end this episode, just like how we ended the previous one and started this one with Makise Kurisu looking on. It places her at the center of all this weird stuff that's been happening. She was the stabbing victim, then opened the episode being alive, and now, again, here she is as something else totally weird has taken place. Without a clear way to establish the new characters into the primary plot thread, I think Steinsgate does a good job of continuing to build intrigue about Okabe's situation, introduce characters and plot details in ways that aren't overly demanding of the audience's attention, all the while giving us more time with the lab members. It's not that the second episode is anything particularly special, but I do appreciate clever format and structure, and I think the second episode has that in spades, given the somewhat middling material it has to work with. Next time on Operation Yggdrasil, we hit episode 3 and start to dive into more of the stuff that the opening half of the first episode promised us. But until then, El Sai Congru.